Well, we are getting ready now for what is going to be a huge, huge day at Bathurst. It is qualifying day. Repco Bathurst 1000. And the cars are lining up now, are ready to go out for practice number three as we prepare to get set for what is going to be a magnificent day. How is our weather here at the moment? It is glorious. There's barely a cloud in the sky. We're building up to a temperature in the high teens, low 20s. And we've already had a very fast start to the weekend and some interesting storylines to unpack. This is going to be a great session. All drivers, and there will be refuelling involved in this as well. Open pit exit. Pit exit is now open. Cars rolling out now as the BP Ultimate pit lane is open for the one-hour practice three session. All drivers able to participate in this one and refuelling will be a factor in this. So everybody's dressed up in their refuelling gear. The rigs will be all set up and ready to feed in that uh, BP Racing fuel. And lots of people with lots of different run programs, depending on how things went yesterday. As we know, there were some compromises in practice two yesterday. The session started late. It didn't run the full timing or distance. And unfortunately for Scott Pye, a problem at the end of it when he made contact with the wall on the outside up at turn four at the cutting. Here's where we're racing this weekend and what a magnificent place to go motor racing it is. We're at Mount Panorama Bathurst and we're a couple of hours to the north-northwest of that fair city of Sydney, up and over the gorgeous Blue Mountains and to this iconic racetrack, 6.2 kilometres around here. The mountain climb is spectacular. The run over the top of the hill we celebrate year in and year out. And we are getting set for this practice session, which will give us some indication of how things are going to form up for qualifying this afternoon. Greater detail now, thanks to Pete's Hut. We break this track into three parts. The first timing sector in sector one gets us up to the initial part of the climb up the hill. You can see the colour change from yellow to blue. Then we measure the performance of the cars over the top of the hill. And then the final sector is really the drag race down that very long Conrod Strait. It's more than one kilometre. It's incredibly fast and the cars will nudge just under 300 kilometres an hour down there. Really needs no introduction. We've seen some spectacular stuff already this weekend. There are stories of plenty. We'll get them started now with a very good morning to Chad Nalon. G'day Neil, yeah it's a beautiful morning down here in Pit Lane. We heard that there was a lot of work going on at Triple Eight with the rear build of Car 87 but there's also been work going on up and down Pit Lane at Blanchard Racing Team. They changed both of their engines overnight. Similar news down at Matt Stone Racing, they did one engine change and also at Tickford. But for BRT that was actually a planned change. Those engines with the newly updated crankshafts arrived at the track yesterday so it was all part of the plan for this team. And the beginning of this session we're just making sure that they are up and running with those two new engines. Thank you for the update, Chad. Quite a number of the four teams were able to run that reconfigured engine yesterday, but not all of them were able to have that change out done in time. Some have elected to do that just a little bit later. So we've got a variety of co-drivers that you'll also see in this session. And you can see on the graphic on the left-hand side of the screen, they're denoted with a green dot against their name. Jamie Winkup's out there. Together with Garth Tander, both those guys are multiple winners here. Together with David Russell, Warren Luff, who got away with an all-time spin yesterday up at the top of the mountain. Declan Fraser, Jordan Boys, Dean Fiore, who wasn't overly well yesterday. In fact, had to jump out of the car at one point. And uh, he's hoping that he's in better shape for today. But this is an amazing storyline. Well done to the men and women at Triple Eight Race Engineering and the Red Bull Ampol Racing Team for getting this car resurrected and back on its feet in showroom condition. We celebrate the skills of everybody in the garages up and down here in the supercars community for the way in which they do their work. Mark Larkin detailed a little earlier how much work has gone on to bringing this car back. So there'll be a systems check here, make sure everything's feeling OK, and they'll get back on with business. And they probably didn't lose too much track time at the end. In fact, Scott ended up, Scott Pye, ended up being 10th fastest at the end of that session, but less than an ideal way to get started. Mark Scopes joined me back into the commentary box. Gorgeous day here, Mark. Not much wind out there at the moment. The sun picking up and we've got a lovely temperature and we're looking forward to a build up to what you and I often talk about privately as being our most exciting day in supercars because qualifying around here is electrifying. It certainly is. Good morning, Neil. And it is one of the great days at Mount Panorama. Qualifying this afternoon is the preeminent session. We rave about how the level of commitment around this racetrack, we know how fast it is, we know how unforgiving it is, and we'll see the very best drivers and the very best cars apply their trade. How about that Red Bull team last night to make that car back to pristine again? I said to Jess a second ago, imagine if you took your road car into your local panel shop, you get it out in two months' time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, beautiful job, and hoping that car's all 
trimmed up nicely from a wheel alignment standpoint. There's no finger trouble or gremlins. Quick recap of practice yesterday. We had two sessions. The second of them didn't run the full hour. Matt Payne was very fast for Penrite Racing and he got into the low sevens, two minutes, 7.2 to be the fastest in practice number one and that actually surprised us a little bit because typically the racetrack has got a bit of dirt dust and debris on it from the build and all of the construction and all of the things that go on in and around the racetrack in the weeks leading up and then the second session was exclusively for the co-drivers and that was headed up by jamie Winkup, four-time winner here he got down to a two minute 7.4 and was pretty happy with his workload yesterday made a couple of little ergonomic changes to that car compared to sandown where that team came home in a one two Jumping on board here with Chas Mostert. Unfortunately, a bit of a compromise run with that car in practice two yesterday, and they were under the rocket covers of that car, rectifying a problem, and it cost Lee Holdsworth a lot of time. He only got two flying laps. Now, one of the things that's changed this year also, Mark, is that the compulsory nature of the brake stop's been removed from the regulations. There used to be a nominated window between X and Y when you had to do a brake change. That's gone this year. In fact, I had to reread the regs over and over to make sure I hadn't missed it. It's up to the teams to determine when they want to do that. So they're rehearsing all of that at the moment. They've got some brilliant systems involved in managing the extreme heat for working in that environment and changing those out quickly within the time it takes to refuel the car and rattle the wheels and tyres on them. This guy was very impressive yesterday. He was caught up in some drama at the start of practice one. He got very few laps, but he ended up two of the ticket cars with Waters and Randall. They were second and fifth, so two cars in the top five. And Randall was really impressive based on the limited laps that he had. Lucker? Yeah, the other change, Strad, what Quampo is just talking about there this year for the race on Sunday is the fuel flow. Now, we've upped the fuel flow to put the teams under a bit of pressure, but we've seen some variability in it. And what we've thought, that Quamtech weren't it engages, if you get that wrong, it can change the flow enormously. But it hasn't been that. There's been another little device, and if I be a mosquito for a sec, and let's fly down into the car, right, that's where it connects. Bzz, down we go, as it'll buzz like a fly. This device here, which is bolted to the top of the fuel cell, right? One's for air and one's for fuel. This part here, the teams have been making and they've been losing a little bit of, you know, let's have a look. Here's the original one and let's have a look at the new one. Now, this is what they were using and they were, you know, giving that a bit of a grind out, doing all sorts of things. This is the new one, it's about four millimetres smaller. Everyone's got the same, Brad Jones, I believe, made them for the whole category. So that ensures when you're doing a driver change, and I just saw 17 second ones, that everyone has exactly the same fuel flow. Neil, probably about 3.5, 3.6 litres per second. Yes, it is. Thanks for that update, Mark. You and I were discussing that a little bit earlier in the weekend. So at Sandown, we thought on average, because the flow rate changes depending on whether it's at the start of the refuel or near the end, but we were talking it up to be around about 3.7 litres per second. We think on average at the moment, it's exactly what Mark just described, 3.5, 3.6. We're going to monitor that because this is the first proper refuelling session now of the weekend and that'll become a factor on Sunday, particularly when we begin to celebrate everything that unpacks from lap 100 to 161 in those last couple of fuel loads and how you manage fuel and whether you fuel save and can get a car out in front of another depending on how much fuel you're willing to risk by holding back relative to another competitor. And the teams wouldn't fail all that to get a little advantage at all, would they? No. Not at all. <laughs> so loophole has been closed there. Yeah, exactly. Now that also means that depending on how you use your fuel and your treatment of that throttle on the right foot, you're probably going to have a range of somewhere between 28 and 30 odd laps around here. They'll be burning on average around about 3.4, 3.5 kilos of fuel with every lap, which has a profound effect having to haul that weight. Think about it in terms of every 10 laps, 35 kilos, up the hill, down the hill, around the corners, swing it around your head and you get yep. an idea of the physics involved in that process. Now, Chas mostert has gone out there while we were having a chat about the fuel and Mark Larkin was updating us and for the first time this weekend we have seen the speediest number. Chas Mostert's just done a 2 minute 6.9. That's the first six that we've seen. He's got four tenths of a second over Richie Stanaway who's blazing at the moment and his time over sector one and across the top of the hill. The Cume here may well knock that time off. So gorgeous conditions out there at the moment. No wind. It was actually, the wind went more southerly in practice two yesterday. Yeah, yep. So that gives them a little hand down Conrad straight. But the flags outside the comm box at the moment are virtually doing nothing. Let's see what Richie can produce here. These guys have been quick so far this weekend. And again, it's a six. And two minutes, 6.8. Nice work. That's four down. This happens with you P1 at the moment by nothing to Now remembering that Richie's also 
at the moment, effectively marketing and advertising his skills because he's out of a full-time drive at the moment with that organisation at the end of the year and hoping to pick up a full-time ride, obviously, in 2025. Brings an enormous amount of skill and experience and an amazing CV. He's had a, a challenge trying to assimilate into the supercar universe. We've detailed that a few times. Now, we've got a special guest here this weekend that's helping out in the pit lane because some of the guys that we obviously see, normally work with are marauding as race drivers this weekend. <laughs> So, great opportunity for us to welcome to the program back into the pit lane as we did yesterday, Molly Taylor, who's a former Australian Rally Champion, British Rally Champion and Extreme E Champion and driver. Good morning again, Molly. Good morning, guys. So, down in Walkinshaw, one of the big stories yesterday was the limited running that these cars did. The car 25 only 18 laps with that engine issue, which has now been shorted. But now we can see that Lee Holdsworth is getting in. Looks like they're going to try to get a lot more running for him, given that he missed out on a heap of that. Yesterday, we also saw Ryan Wood come in a little bit early. I spoke to Fabian Coulthard, his co-driver. Ryan's going to do one more stint out there, then the plan is for Fabian to jump in that car and then do some race running laps to finish out the session. And one of the quick guys yesterday was the combination Jaden Ojeda and Jack LeBrock. Uh, finished up co-driver session in P3. Well done, mate. Just give us a bit of a summary of your day. Yeah, it was good. Um, Jack had a good run in practice one and the car was dropped the whole way through the session and then I jumped in in practice two and wanted to take a little bit of time to adjust after doing the GT in, uh, in Indy on the weekend. So I uh, felt really comfortable straight away. So just got on with our program and uh, yeah, ended up pretty sharp at the end of the session. So it was all, all happy days for the first day. What's the plan for this morning? Uh, practice some pit stops. Uh, Jack's in the car now, just doing some more balance runs and then I'll jump in about halfway and do much the same, but uh, just taking advantage of the live pit lane. How's the jet lag? Good, actually, good. I was actually quite surprised. On the way there, I was, I was good as well, and then on the way back, I was expecting it to be a lot worse, but sleeping through the whole night, so can't complain. Have a good day, mate. Well Thank done. Thank you. One team that's not going to get both cars, uh, both drivers in the session for this one is Car 17 at Shell V-Power Racing. They have made the decision to just sit Kai Allen out for this session following a really nasty crash at Reed Park in his Dunlop Series qualifying. So Will will take that car to himself. It does mean they don't get to practice driver change practice in this session. It also means that Kai won't get some laps in, but they're just going to focus on his co-driver session for tomorrow. So Kai's just going to take a breather in this one. Yeah, I think that's probably a smart play. That was a nasty shunt for those that missed it at the top of the hill in Dunlop Super 2 qualifying just prior to the commencement of this session. And remember, he's vying for another championship win in that series in 2024, and that would have been a rattler. Um, on that topic, uh, Scott Pye is back on the horse. They've got him back out in that car now. That's probably an important thing for him to get back out there. Jamie Wincup suggested last night, I spoke to Jamie as he came back into the paddock after the session, that it was a good idea for Scott to have a bad memory and put it all behind him, have an ice cream, and not think too deeply about it. So he's back out there in the race car at the moment doing what he does best. So Stadaway, who's the fastest at the moment, has come back into the lane. And then it's Holdsworth, who yesterday got compromised running. He's back out in the car. He needs valuable laps here as well. Then Nick Perkett, who's sharing with Dylan O'Keefe, is currently in the car. Cam Hill's just gone straight ahead over the top of the hill at Skyline, by the way, in the shortcut up there. New livery this weekend for Macaulay Jones and Jordan Boys. Combo from Aubrey in the Pizza Hut car, promoting the Venom movie this weekend. So a few people didn't get their full runs done yesterday because of the compromise session and therefore didn't stay with the entire run plan. So they've had to sort of compromise what was going to happen yesterday versus what they're actually executing this morning. And good job there with Matt Stone racing with Perk Hatton Hill there, third and fourth. They're continuing to improve those cars. And in terms of combinations that will play a role in determining this year's winner, there's certainly going to be a lot more cars than just the obvious four or five or half dozen that we've spoken about a lot. There's probably 10 or 12 serious combinations through the field that are capable of winning this race this weekend. And yesterday, remember, in the first session, we had eight cars within two tenths of a second. Impressive, wasn't it? This is Dean Fiore in car number 50, SCT Logistics. He's sharing this car with Jackson Evans up at Forest Selva, about to make the run down Conrad Strait. He was feeling a bit off colour yesterday, so hopefully he's shaken that off this morning. Let's get back to Molly. Chaz Mostert sitting in P2 this morning. It was a different story yesterday with the engine issue, not much running, but you seem to have turned it around this morning. Yeah, the uh, car's actually rolled out pretty good. So yesterday was just about validating the, the car balance we had, and we know the track's going to change a lot throughout this weekend. So, um, yeah, today I think the track's probably met us halfway. We made a few changes, which made the car feel pretty good. But, um, yeah, didn't expect to really be there rolling out of this session, but um, always Bathurst in the cold temperatures in the morning. It feels really nice. I'm sure we'll roll out at lunch and go, where is all our grip gone? So, um, 
No, it's just good. It's good to get some laps now. Paul Bugger yesterday didn't get many in co-driver sessions, so um, yeah, the priority is to try and get him comfortable in the car, but the car feels not too bad. I'm sure we can make it a little bit better, but um, I'm uh, happier today than I was yesterday so far. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Molly. Cheers. New fastest lap in practice three, Thomas Randall. We just caught the back end of the lap. Two minutes, 6.8 seconds. Two one hundredths of a second is the margin over Richie Stanaway. Lee Holdsworth is in Chaz's car at the moment in position three, tight at the top. So looking at that spread at the moment, Mark, you just talked about the top eight yesterday cool. being covered by 0.2 at, at the moment. Go, 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 got, go. Uh, 0.2 covering the top four cars, roughly a second covering the top ten cars. A variety of people on quite different run programs. Dunlop hard tyre this weekend. If you look at that side wall, you'll see the pink lettering on there. So uh, the Breast Cancer Foundation is being supported by Dunlop. And every pit stop in the race this weekend represents a $50 contribution to a very important cause. Great, isn't it? Fantastic. Thank you all for Dunlop, who've been partners of the series now for more than two decades. Will Davison has just jumped up now into position number five in car number 17. So how's three different teams of Mustangs? So Tickford with Randall, who I said at the start of the session was impressive yesterday. It's now the fastest with a 684. Stanaway has done a 687 and Mostert prior. Holdsworth's in the car right now, but Mostert did a 6.9. So 0.05 separates the top three Mustangs. James Courtney on screen here has just jumped up 17 positions into position number five for Snowy River Caravans. They lost a little bit of straight line speed in practice one yesterday, which mystified them, but clearly they're back on top of that now. That's a good time, a low seven for James. Vastly experienced and sharing with Jack Perkins here this weekend. He's been on the podium multiple times, James, and he's been up there also with Jack. So they'll be a strong combination. That's a decent number that's been recorded here by Will Davison in that first sector. I'm just watching him at the moment. He's just making his way over the top of the mountain in car number 17. The significance there is that car overheated yesterday quite significantly and ended up with really hot water and oil temperature. Uh, they changed the radiator in the car, they bled the system, and hopefully everything is all A-OK -okay again now with that car. That's Garth Tander disappearing off the end of the chase. Very hard to get the car settled through the fast right, then get it stopped for the slow left. And this is on board now with Will Davison, who we've heard is going to have ownership of this car for the whole session based on the incident just prior to the session with yeah, his young co-driver. He's faster than any other in the first sector. Over the top of the hill, he's less than a tenth away from Thomas Randall, who mastered everything over the top of the hill. He's in the final sector now. Traffic. Is traffic going to be an issue when he gets into the braking area down here? He's got the R&J batteries entry here and the mobile entry just in front of him. Don't know whether it's going to harm him. He's managed to comfortably clear the traffic, so hopefully this doesn't compromise the lap, but this could be good enough for Will Davison, former dual race winner, to get to the top of the tree here. Not quite. He might have been compromised there in that last sector. Three tenths in the last sector. So 41.2 for Brown, fastest car in the last sector. 41.5 for Davison. It wasn't all that traffic. He actually missed the apex at the last right. corner slightly by probably, you know, three or 400 mil. So that's probably in terms of the number, if you, if you take the three tenths out, you park yourself basically Will Davison at a number like a six, seven. Now Courtney's come up to be 86 ten thousandths of a second away from Randall. So at the moment, there's five different Ford teams, one, two, three, four, five, separated by 0.17 of a second. So Randall, Courtney, Stanaway, Holdsworth, Davison. Very impressive, especially the run there from Stanaway early and the run that Mostert put on at the start of the session. So Randall continues to be the fastest with a 684. And it does look like, from a Tickford perspective, that those cars are working really well, especially across the top of the hill. Re? And just a reminder, we have two wild cards this weekend, the Boost Mobile entering Matt Charter and Brad Vaughan, and the Make It Super entering Craig Lowndes and Cooper Murray. The unique thing is they share one boom, one crew. So the Make It Super entry has just come in to do a brake rehearsal change, and the Boost Mobile entry has just come in and done a driver change rehearsal. So they have to manoeuvre from two different teams to work on both of their cars. Now, Brad Vaughan's just jumped in the Boost Mobile entry. He just got his Boost Mobile pole position. A 2.047 in the Dunlop Super 2s. He's out there now in the main game. 
pretty good day at the races yesterday for Cam Hill. He ended up fourth in that first practice session. He's sitting inside the top ten right now. I grabbed a quick word off Cameron Crick, his co-driver. Said, how did he feel yesterday? He said, yeah, it was OK. So despite all that speed, this might be quicker than his teammate, Cam Hill still thinks there's more performance, particularly in the front end of that car. They're working on that in this session. They're going to put Cameron Crick in a bit later to a nice, big, heavy run in that car. Yeah, it's always interesting. Thanks, Chad. The, the ability to keep on providing the feedback and just keep on creeping up on little gains is the key to all these practice sessions leading into qualifying and then ultimately the race because there's little parts of the track that the drivers need to be super critical of what the balance is like and essentially what you're looking for is a car that's relatively easy to drive because if the car is too oversteering and too twitchy, too agile, it's a long, long day, and the propensity to make a mistake and fire in the fence somewhere is very high. So what they've got to do at the moment as a race car is try to build up to a speed where they're happy. They've, they will have all thought overnight around what sort of lap time for the day. Wait, wait, Today's wait, conditions wait, wait, are obviously wait, wait, better than wait, yesterday. Wait. Go, go, but go, go, you want go. a car that, that flows nicely, achieves the speed without having white knuckle fever, without hanging onto the wheel and having the tiger by the tail. So Everingham now jumps in Thomas Randall's car. Holdsworth, we know, is already on board Mostert's car. Jack LeBrock has now come up with a seven dead, so he's the first of the Camaros. He's actually there as Smokey. Jack LeBrock and Jaden Ojeda this weekend. They did a really good job yesterday too. Fast at Sandown and uh, always quick here. And uh, there is the car. We'll give the sister car there a moment ago. Well, actually, the shot was telling and I was going to pick up that subject that with a lot of the driver combinations clearly got different size and scope of body and as a result of that different people run different seat inserts so we might get the pit lane reporting team to have a bit of a look a bit of a look at some of the variations in that so apart from all of the other things that you've got to manage which is getting the fuel on doing brake changes on occasion getting the wheels and tires on and just the complexity of the lack of space to be able to climb in and out of the car one of the other things that many of them have got to do is manage an insert seat yeah. And uh, that sometimes can actually be a challenge because they get caught in the heat of the moment, don't go in properly or don't come out properly, and it's another little thing to manage. Well, it also, half the time when you drag them back out, it tends to turn the belt over, doesn't it? So keeping the belts in situ that when you pull the insert out that it doesn't affect the belt for the incoming driver or the other way around is always problematic. So any time that you can get away with having the least amount of all that stuff, the better it is. And that's why if you've got two fast driver combinations that are similar frame size and they can just jump in and out, it's one less box to tick in a complex process. So at the moment, we've got Ford Mustang one to four and the drivers in those cars at the moment are Tyler Everingham Every from Dubbo, Jack Perkins from Melbourne, which is done away originally out of New Zealand, and Lee Holdsworth in Chas Mostert's car. That's one to four. That spread at the moment is an amazing five one hundredths of a second in 6,200 metres of racetrack. First of the Camaros is Jack LeBron, and it's Will Davison with some encouraging pace, followed by Nick Perkat. Cam Hill was fast yesterday, and he was really quick at the opening round here at the commencement of the championship season. Robotham and Scott Pye back into that car importantly today. And Scott Pye on the last lap did an 8.42, so the fastest lap that that car with Will Brown on board is currently stands at a 7.44. Scott there on 8-4, so that's quite encouraging for him getting back on the horse and driving the car and making sure that there's no dramas. We're obviously concerned about making sure that he was comfortable again today. They've done a great job with Scott to do that. So on board, you can see the car flowing really nicely. The cars are a bit... But a lot of the comment from yesterday, Neil, was that a lot of the drivers are saying that with the hard compound tyre, they didn't feel like the tyre was engaging with the surface. Therefore, it lacked, it felt a bit greasy and lacked the ultimate grip, which you would expect as a consequence of being a public road, and all the first sessions are always like that. And then the second thing that they were saying is that the cars, as a consequence of lack of grip, they had entry understeer, so lacking front grip on the way to the corner, and then oversteer off the corner, so lacking rear grip coming away from the corner on exit. And then a lot of the people saying how hard they were to drive. And one of the comments around the 888 cars, especially with Will Brown, was just a bit lively. You know, OK for qualifying, get away with 
a couple of laps like this because slightly lively, slightly oversteery is actually faster around here, but you don't want a car that's too oversteery. No, you certainly don't want it through the whole day. Yeah. Means you're closer to the edge typically. So we're just nudging uh, about 17 and a half degrees here at the moment. Temp's just coming up a little bit. That breeze has just picked up ever so gently from the north. It means we've actually got a tiny little bit of headwind coming down Conrod Strait. That's the view looking over towards the east and the mountain ridge that ultimately leads to the Blue Mountains and then down the other side to Sydney. You can see that it's uh, absolutely gorgeous conditions here at the moment. But uh, we've already had quite a bit of wind variation in the three sessions. So on Thursday morning, yesterday morning, it was from the west about 10 to 15 k's. In the afternoon, it was predominantly from the south about 10 to 20. And this morning, we've got very little, little bit of headwind right on the nose of these cars. And it does have an impact around here. So most of the teams measure the wind direction. They obviously measure temperature and pressure, and they monitor all that very carefully as well, because we're also a long way above sea level here at Mount Panorama. You can see those flag, flags just very lightly dancing in the background here at the moment. And skinnier air means that a little less engine performance and a little less performance of the air uh, licking over the wings on the car. And that's obviously also been reduced in the Gen 3 era. So aero plays a role in racing cars, but a little less so in the current generation of vehicle. Craig Lounge leaping out of the car down there at the super cheap garage and getting into that car is Cooper Murray. Let's get to Molly. Bit of more, more drama down here at Tickford. Yesterday was power steering. Today, a water pump as Tyler went out, which is also drives the power steering. So that would have been an interesting outlap for you, Tyler. What happened? Um, yeah, it looks like the water pump's failed um, on the front of the motor and it obviously drives the, the alternator and the power steering pump. Um, so yeah, lucky it was sort of on a lap lap because if I was on a, on a fly, it wouldn't have been fun losing power steering. But um, yeah, disappointing, but uh, we'll get it back out there. Anything they can do for this session or you think it's a re reset for next one? No, nah, I think it's done for this session. So we'll just uh, reset and go again. Yeah, no worries. We'll just quickly try and um, have a word to Tom, if we can. Tom, um, cracking pace out there um, before it all went wrong, but uh, it was good while it was going. Yeah, that's uh, sometimes the way it goes, huh? but hey, that's why it's practice, right? We, we, we had a problem yesterday in practice one and missed the first 35 minutes and the thing was pretty quick and we've kind of done the opposite now. We got the first 20 minutes and now it's, I don't know what happened, something to do with the water pump or, yeah, but Tyler did well to keep it off the fence. So yeah, it's a bit of a shame that we're having these problems, but you know, if, if we're going to have them, the time is to have them now. And but look, the crew are doing an incredible job, as they always do. They'll get it sorted. I mean, they did an engine change last night on this car, so they were here till after midnight. So um, big credit to them. And, you know, look, it's hard to know what fuel level and tyres everyone's on, but um, it's always nice being that end of the timesheets, I guess. Thanks, Tom. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks, Molly. OK, I just want to... I want to cover off this... Uh Pit stop here, Neil. We were talking about the fuel rates, right? Now, these driver chains, I watched these guys at Sandown. They were doing about 17 seconds. And what's really difficult is the aperture, that roll cage aperture. Scotty Pye said to me, the aperture he can get in all right, but where his leg goes in, there's a leg protector there. It's just really hard to get his leg in. Now, there's a bit more science to this. We told you about the fuel flow a minute ago, right? So you know, everyone in the pit lane has the same towers, they're at the same height, so the same gravity, the same head, they have the same Comtech head there, same hoses, same everything. So that's why that fuel flow is critical. So you just saw 17 seconds, or just timed to 16 seconds. When they were practicing here, they were doing 15 seconds before. I can tell you for a fact, on Sunday, if you do a six or a seven stop strategy, which is the likely strategy, somewhere in that, you're going to have to do a stop that's around 21 seconds or 21 seconds, 20 seconds. So if safety cars, maybe even less. And Jamie Winkup knows, he said it to me, we know we're going to have to do a driver change where the driver change will be the thing that holds up. One final thing, I noticed they're doing that that quickly now. The thing that's holding up a lot of these stops is the guy jumping in the left-hand side of the car, filling up the cool box, the drinks bottle and everything. He's doing it about 18. So it's really tight margins. Yeah, there's going to be some pressure in that corner of the race this weekend, isn't there? Just because the fuel rates come up for the refueling, that's got everybody under pressure. And there's always pressure in those pit stops because it's never quite the same in the theatre of war that it is in the workshop when you rehearse it. All of the teams do extensive amount of often daily pit stop practice. 
it's an intense work regime that tries to refine all that because compared to the investment that's made in other areas of the sport, it's a relatively cheap investment to try and get that part as smooth and silky as you can get it. If you can find a second in your pit stops, you know, to try and do that from an engineering sense might cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's why they work hard at it, but it, it, no more so and no more importance than when we come to this event. Those measurements that Mark Larkin was talking about then are all critical. So the height of the refuelling rig is preset, the height of the gantry, that's maximum two metres. The, the length of the gantry is a maximum of five metres. The, you would be amazed at home, folks, to drill down into the detail that is to try and stop people from trying to find a way to get a millimetre here or a millilitre there uh, in whatever it is. And Mark actually detailed before about the top of the fuel tank and the change that's been made just recently because teams are paid to try and exploit every opportunity to make a tenth of a second and they will do it all day long and all night and all year. 100%. Quick word on car 88, which is in the hands of Brock Feeney right now. They're sitting 20th at the moment. The word that I heard Brock over the radio using to describe that feeling that he had inside the car was scared. He was a bit scared of how it was going to respond. I quizzed Jamie on what he meant. He's talking about the rear stability of that car. And he's just come back out of pit lane where they have put in a new set of rear shocks and springs to try and tame the rear end of that car down. Whose idea was it to go aggressive? It was Jamie's, he said. He's been trying to talk Brock Feeney into getting a little bit more aggressive with that setup, but they've decided to just scale it back a bit. <laughs> Mark actually detailed before that uh, if you've got a car that's oversteer, you might get away with it for a lap or two to try and jag a time in qualifying. But a car that scares you, inverted commas, around this racetrack for 161 laps is no fun. And uh, when you're under pressure and you've got a bunch of cars around and behind you, and you've got the one that's flapping like a flag, then you're vulnerable to being passed and you just won't have a mistake-free run. You no. just cannot execute 23 corners and 161 laps under that pressure and not bowl a wide at some stage. For sure, and if you add fuel to that, it makes it worse. So if you've got a car that, in sort of qualifying spec with low fuel load, that's a little bit oversteer, and you stick a heap of juice on board and you increase the amount of weight and all that inertia that happens when it does escape from you in oversteer sliding land, you get a mistake like a Scott Pye one yesterday, especially they're the spots that get you, the ones that aren't as obvious. Down the escape row there, one of the Neulon cars. Nice flick spin, well done. Is that Tim Slade? Uh, no, it's Cam McLeod. Well done. He's one of the rookies here, there are six of them this weekend. Made his supercar debut at Bathurst. He's been running in Dunlop Super 2 and got a serious pedigree. His grandfather won this race back in 1987 in Peter Brock's team. And his dad's been a racer and is a noted industry figure as well. It's a little lock up down here. He's just released the brake and gone down the escape road. No damage done. Partially on his way to Orange, but gave that idea away and came back on and uh, able to fight for another day. And you'll see people trying to exploit their braking down there. They want to get into that corner as deep and as hard as they can. That exit here onto Mountain Straight is so critical to lap time certainly is. So we're picking up there is uh, Mark Winterbottom and Alex Mark Caruso on board at the moment. They're in the Dewalt Camaro and Mark Caruso obviously between the Winterbottom Caruso combination they've got so many starts in terms of their experience and the team alongside them with David Reynolds and Warren Luff, very similar. So a very experienced outfit in that garage, Charlie Swerkholz team there at Team 18. We're in the second half of this practice three, by the way, and if you look down the totem, you can see how many co-drivers have now been inserted. So many people have got similar run plans in how this is going. So we're in that phase of practice now Friday morning where hopefully they've made several changes to the car. They've begun to settle it down. They've started to harvest some data about fuel flows and brake wear and tyre wear and all of those things. Now they want to try and get both drivers comfortable and rehearse those pit stops because there's a full rehearsal going on. And you can see that the vast majority of the field at the moment has got the Coeys out there trying to get them into a rhythm around here. Crumbo, you were speaking about booster seats and uh, seat inserts for drivers. I was just trying to get a word with Bryce forward, but he's just about to get in the car. He's got Bryce's booster seat in his hands at the moment. I said, mate, how much does this impact your pit stop? And he said, it's a real pain in the backside, but he said it with a few other terms involved as well. So it just goes to show how much it does impact the driver changes. Of course, he's paired up with Jalen Robotham. They're about to pit and do a brake and pad change as well. Yeah, we're just looking at those images now. Thanks for that update, Reid. It was a 
graphic illustration of what it all looks like. It's a quite a big device, and with all the other things going on, it's another element to manage. We're going to witness this now. Right so, here. yeah, thank you. Midi's electrical entry in the pit lane. Nine people are permitted to cross the line out of the garage to come and jump onto the car. Some of them choose to use a driver assist to help the driver out and in. And it's quite a process in the brake change here. This is the most treacherous part of the whole process because there's so yeah, much heat down there and there's so much can go wrong. And we've seen incidents previously where someone hasn't pumped the brake pedal as they exit the pit lane to make sure that you've got brake pedal pressure when you head up mountain straight. And if that is not fully up to pressure and you put your foot on the brake, the pedal travels and you end up with a heap of rear brake, no front brake in relative terms, and you'll lock up the rear of the car and spear into the wall at turn two, which has been modified, the safety barrier up there at turn two this year. Go, 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 go. So that right front was a bit tardy then. And they'll go back and have a long, hard think about why. Oh. Todd Hazelwood, we can see Brody Kostecki just about to head back out. This car was in the garage for a while. Looked like a pretty significant rear geometry change you guys were, were making. You had a few laps in the car this morning. How was it? Yeah, everything feels really good. Yeah, the number one Chico uh, Camaro feels really strong. So, yeah, I've done all my running on full loads of fuel. And whenever the car's fast on a full load of fuel, it's really confidence inspiring. So, yeah, Brody's now going to obviously put a bit more focus into trying to tune up the quality car for this afternoon now. But um, really strong start for the whole Erebus team. Both cars are fast. We've both got smiles on our faces. But, um, yeah, just trying to go through the motions. You know, it's a long build-up. The track just keeps changing. But, um, yeah, it's always nice when you can roll the cars out of the truck and be fast straight away. And you were saying just before your job's done, so a few Chico rolls chill out so Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll kick back now, have a few Chico rolls and uh, enjoy Brody this afternoon. Thanks, Don. Cheers, thank you. Down at Tickford, we heard Thomas Randall say earlier that there is no way of knowing who's doing what across the field. And that's very much the truth for his teammate right now as well. Now, this car, if you look at timing, guys, is down in 25th, but it's certainly not indicative of where their speed is at. This is 100% about race pace. That car is full of BP racing fuel right now, and they're working on their race speed. That last lap was a 2.090, their best a 2.087, so they are really in race trim right now for car six. So Todd Hazel will talk about that car with Brody Kostecki, but they're clearly not eating too many Chico rolls. I've just had word that they are the fastest car at the moment down Conrad and up elbow. the hill because um, that's not necessarily engine because everyone's got the same engines. There's a red flag out there now. What's going on? Uh, we've got a car that's uh, parked awkwardly up at the elbow here, Larko. Sorry to interrupt. We yeah. might just come back to your little yarn there while we unpack what's going on here with Camp Creek. So something weird. I reckon he may have made contact with the wall. Left-hand side looks like yeah, earlier damaged. So uh, this fellow made his supercar debut at Sandown, and he's busy being a busy boy in support cats as well. So uh, he's not in a hurry to leap out of the car. He's clearly OK at the moment. We'll see if the replay tells us a bit more about what's going on here. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's heavy contact. That, that's serious. Concrete munching going on there all the way down from the right hand kink approaching the elbow and then to the elbow itself. That uh, looks like, sorry Neil, that looks like it made contact with that right hand inside first. Prior. Yeah. It had that look, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. So I wonder whether that had a, any influence on the steering. Yeah, and it's actually prior to that. Yeah. yeah. So this might be the effect, not the cause. So that's a similar thing to the Mostert one many years ago where he had that monumental crash in qualifying but it looked like it pinballed itself from yeah. the right hand wall we're going to get the team are currently just going to go back and see whether we can find that shot a little bit earlier now yeah right there so it could have been the gutter or it might have been a little bit of the wall maybe it's that next one yeah, yeah. the next one yeah. yeah yeah so we don't actually get to fully see it sadly the sp tools entry that he's sharing with cameron hill uh has got a lot of damage and there is Cam from the ACT. So hopefully there's not too much of a bruise on that car and they can get it rectified and get it back out there. That's going to take some time. Real frustration there for Cameron Crick. What a, what a shame. And he's been so enthusiastic and, and looking forward so much. He, he was bouncing earlier in the week about yeah. the prospect of driving one of these cars. He was literally saying, I can't believe that I'm getting to do this. 
and it's one of the many new combinations that have been paired up for this weekend and previously at Sandown. There were very little in the way of continuity. There are only seven combos that stayed the same from 23 into 24. 19 new pairings, therefore we've got 26 entries this weekend and two of them are wildcard entries. Uh, opportunity also for us just while we're in clean-up mode here to say a big thanks as always. We like to try and thank the volunteer officials. There's hundreds of people that come to Bathurst and they sacrifice their private time to be able to execute this race meeting in both administration and all around the racetrack. So thank you all for the hard work and the commitment. Yes, they do an exceptional job, don't they? And uh, they put a, all of their time. And so I don't think it's there. No, I don't think it is either. No, I think it's, I think it's right just here. there. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's either a combination of, sometimes we've seen some drivers with getting down a gear. So remember we had Slade have that one there in the Mustang before he did that. Yeah. Um, but it does look like with the trajectory of the car, that it just glanced the inside wall and then pinballed it across. Great for the crowd then to be applauding Cam Crick getting out, the young 26-year-old who was so pumped by this opportunity to get on board and do this event with Cam Hill. It's a big opportunity for him and I feel really sorry for him that that's been a little spot that catches you out and there's no doubt about this racetrack. It's just so unforgiving. And came home in a fabulous 10th position just previously at Sandown. So I, yeah, it was awkwardly in the gutter there, but I don't know. I think you're, you're right that that's not the spot. It's the bit that where we're slightly blind here where there may have been some contact with that right hand front part of this. But yeah, it could also be the downshift as you described. There's a whole bunch of things we can't speculate because uh, I'm sure Cameron's going to be able to explain to us what's going on at some point. So that car in recovery now, the clock uh, still counting down. And for the second successive practice session, last night was the same. Uh, we've got a compromise back into the session. Do you reckon there's a scuff mark on that uh, right front guard? Yeah, just on this, look at the lower part of the wing. And, yeah, right there. So. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon you're right. I reckon there's been something, there's more to the story. And, it's, and I think you can see on the sidewall of the tyre there at the same time. So see that little bit of swarf on the bottom okay. of the wheel? Right at the bottom of the, the rim. Wheel. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's got the inside guard and it's got the bottom of the wheel. Now that may have come from that also, but, but that's not actually the reaction. That could have been a little graunch from there. But this one, watch the angle. As it comes past the boost mobile sign, it's, it's basically gone straight over. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that doesn't look That's anything like the normal approach line, does it? Yeah, exactly. So the good news is that Cameron's all OK. He's out of that car and, uh, yeah, there's pretty significant scuffing there. It's plucked all of the lettering off the sidewall of the tyre there as well. So uh, that uh, Matt Stone Racing team now will go to hard work now to in assessment to see whether that car uh, can be stood up straight once again and get it back out there later on in the day. We'll get back into the pit lane with Molly. Cam Hill watching on here. You can see the devastation in Cam Crick's face. Have you heard from him? Obviously, it looks like he's OK, first and foremost, but has there been any feedback from him yet? Uh, yeah, he's OK. Um, obviously, pretty gutting for him. You know, he he wouldn't have wanted to do that today. But, um, look, it's still Friday. Uh, we've got a really fast car, so the boys, you know, they'll, they'll fix her up and we'll try to get back out there for quality this afternoon. We could see you guys looking at the data traces here from the car. We were just looking at, at the way the accident happened, which looked a bit strange, like there's there's something more to the story. Is there anything that you can determine at this point or are you just waiting until Cam gets back? Yeah, I can't really see enough. Normally, if you go in there, you've either got the inside wall or you've you've got the downshift wrong. So we'll have a look at it. He was, he was struck along pretty good up until then. So, um, you know, he'll learn from this and we'll, we'll bounce back. Thanks, Cam. Cheers. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I'm a little bit with you, Crompo. That does look weird, doesn't it? I mean, if we just look at our race circuit here, here we are down here in the pit lane. So it happened right up here before what we call Forest Elbow. And, yeah, it just looked awkward, didn't it? Like it wasn't turning properly. The, the, the angle of the car in both those corners didn't quite look right. But anyway, I'll go back to where I was before. So in that session right there, we saw the Kostecki uh, Hazelwood car was the quickest car both down the straight and up the mountain. Now, that can be for a variety of reasons because they've all got the same engines. Is they, are they running a little less aero? Are they running a little less fuel in that session? We don't know those things. But that's impressive nevertheless. But 
Um, what I wanted to talk about here was Scotty Pye's crash. Now, Scafie's mentioned there's been plenty of good people, great drivers, that have crashed up here at the cutting. Now, when you come up here, you're in third gear, you're doing just a sniff under 200 k's an hour. And as you turn, you've got to get down into second, or down into second gear, look at that, old driver, do using a H pattern. You've got to go down into second gear, down about 90 k's an hour, so it's really slow. But the problem is the car's turning as you do that, right? So the car's all loaded up, the load is in its front wheel, right? And you're braking hard, so it's really easy for the rear of the car to brake traction. It's really hard to manage this. So when we have a bit of a look, are just some of the greats that have done exactly this. Laurie, Larry Perkins here a few years ago, locks up a front, backs are in there. Then this is Jamie Winkup doing exactly the same thing. And this is the one that gets me, the master of the mountain, the king of the mountain, Peter Brock, exactly the same sort of crash. Up on its nose, lock the rears, bang, and in the fence. And look at this, you don't see too often Peter Brock, right, getting flung around in a race car like that. Really rare sight, that is. And you see Scotty Pye, exactly the same circumstance. Now, when we look here, in fact, I'm just gonna to go to this, I slowed it up. When Scotty went up there, one of the dramas late in the afternoon at Bathurst, we've all experienced, and it gets worse in the race when there's insects on your screen, is this. And I reckon just as he's turned in there, you can see those flashes of sunlight. And as MS said, Scafie said, You've only got to be this far off that tram track and there's little bits of rubber and marble and dust and you're turning it in and if you miss that by a little bit then you've got to be a little more acute with the steering but this happens with the rear of the car as you're down changing, trying to brake it, really difficult thing and if you go back and Google crashes at the cutting, everyone's crashed there. Scafie? Except me. I crashed everywhere else, just didn't crash there. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about we talked about the, uh, the sunlight effect yesterday at the end of Fit Straight and also up there. Here's the reason for the red flag for Cameron Crick in the SP Tools entry. Question marks over whether or not there was some right-hand contact with the wall that disturbed the steering prior to getting down here to the elbow. Remembering that coming down that part of the mountain, you're getting back to the best part of 185 odd kilometres an hour on the approach down there. Good news is that he's all okay and out of there. But yes, how's the roll call of some of those that have notably come unstuck in that corner of the universe? The late great Peter Brock. Larry Perkins was the practice incident in 2003. There was the famous or infamous Greg Murphy, Marcus Ambrose thing in the race there in 2005. Win Cup in 2020. James Courtney in the March race in 2021. And the Kidna gave it a lash also <laughs> in 21, but didn't have a shunt, got away with it. <laughs> a very lucky Echidna that day, wasn't it? Yep. Walking along the track in that spot there, straight under the Schick Hydro sign. The little Echidna was trying to get its way outside of the concrete barriers. Well, if ever there was a place where you had the right logos over the top of it for a close shave location yeah. around this track, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> Great to see so many people coming into Bathurst this weekend and supporting the event. Lots of families here and uh, the Track to Town activity on Wednesday and the downtown parade and having everybody from the supercar community down there was hugely supported and another great initiative. Uh, we did one of those at Topor in New Zealand earlier in the year and it just went completely off. It was uh, outstanding. And uh, we're continuing to build Welcome up to, to what is going to be an Head excellent, great race, we believe, coming up on Sunday. 161 laps around here. And the reason we say that is because the times are tight at the top of the tree. We've got very competitive combinations and we've got some really speedy lap times going on out there at the moment. And just even looking at the frozen clock as the cars roll out at the moment, we've got four people in the high sixes around here with direct sunlight on the racetrack as we come up to near 11 o'clock local time. So you would think even though the wind's down a little bit with all that sunlight on the racetrack, she wouldn't be that speedy out there at the moment, but they are very intense and quick times. Mark Winterbottom car is just about to head back on track. Michael Caruso in the car for you guys. How's your weekend unfolding so far? Uh, we didn't have a good day yesterday, um, to be honest, and we just never got a tire on. So we always uh, were down the order because everyone's putting new tires on, but. The flip side is today we got to put tyres on in this session to have a run and we're a lot better but still a little bit off but uh, the, the temperature in the UV is affecting the track you know when we rolled out it's a lot more grippier than what it is right now so um, it's it's difficult it's probably one of the slipperiest tracks I've been to in the last 23 years other than when it rained and we had canoes here running down the hill in that rain but it's really slippery so pretty tough. Temperature, rain, snakes, what's the most scary part? Ah, uh, that snake, yes, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? But then, how's that, um, they pan from the snake to a kangaroo, and I'm waiting for the echidna to come out and start attacking them both, so that's Bathurst. It's, um, 
Yeah, it's really cool, but it's funny. Everyone sat here going, oh, I'd go and get it, but no one got off their chair to do it. Like, they're all as big as sooks as what I am, so uh, that guy did a good job. Thanks for the chat, mate. Hope you have a good day. Cheers, thank you. Just a quick update. Oh, sorry, Neil, to step on you there for a second, mate. But uh, Tyler Everingham back out on track, by the way, guys, which is uh, really good news. So the bad news at Matt Stone Racing is actually good news down here for Tickford because all that red flag time gave them the chance to change the water pump on that car, and they got it done inside 15 minutes with help from the folks at Ford. Thankfully, everything is at the front of the engine. Despite all the heat, they're able to get that job done, fill it up full of fluid and get it back out there. Hello, Thomas Randall. They're happy. They're smiling because their car's back on the racetrack. So we, we celebrate very brave people in these cars, but the bravest bloke on the planet yesterday was the gentleman that was able to go and grab that eastern brown snake from Forest Elba. That was brave. Yeah, that was scary, wasn't it? So, uh, well done. One of the unique features of this country location in New South Wales on the central tablelands. And uh, there's kangaroo deterrents that are used here because quite a lot of uh, mobs of kangaroos that are all in and around the paddocks all around here. It's, it's surrounded by uh, some beautiful scenery here. There's um, 40 private residences, there's a winery, a restaurant, a gun and car and motorcycle clubs, accommodation as well, but there's, there's a bit of wildlife <laughs> to negotiate. So there's a, a view from uh, up the top of the mountain. It's 174 metres or 570 feet from that pit lane to the top of the mountain. But uh, this entire location is a long way above sea level, about 2,500 feet above sea level down there in Sydney. So, but uh, beautiful on a day like today with no wind out there. The temperature's come up about one degree. It's about 18 out there at the moment. The cars are back out there cycling up on their next lap. We've got just inside 20 minutes remaining uh, in this session. So uh, we'll see whether or not we end up with any Hollywood numbers at the end. It was interesting to hear what Mark Winterbottom was describing there, the difference in the complexion of the racetrack from the commencement of the session to now with the impact of the UV and that rising temp. The interesting thing is we're racing from 11.30 on Sunday morning, and so we're still half an hour away from that at the moment. So there are the kind of conditions out there at the moment that we in theory have on Sunday. So you also want to make sure that you and your car are matched to these conditions yeah, and not some other mythical time and place and temperature that really doesn't exist until later on Sunday afternoon where we might might get a shower or two. Yes, there is a forecast that says in the afternoon that we may have some wet weather. Now, in the middle of this racetrack, Brock Feeney has just done the fastest session time across the top. He's on a 33.80, which is pretty much what Cam Waters did yesterday to be the fastest car across the top of the hill. So Brock Feeney's going to pop up. Will Brown's on his personal best lap, and you can see there Feeney's chasing the monster Mustang just in front. So as they come across the strike, we'll have a look at the number, and Feeney goes to the top with a 6.78. It's six one hundredths of a second faster than the number that Thomas Randall did earlier. So Chad talked before about the feedback from Brock in the car after they tried a different geometry or suspension combination with that car, and he was describing it as scary. Well, they've obviously settled it down nicely to restore his confidence because you must have confidence over the top of the hill to be the fastest in that sector at the moment. So a 6-7 validates the change back to something more conservative. It's been a bit aggressive too in the, the run in there behind Cam Waters, which is good. And all these little laps in the precursor, in the practice sessions, there's the damage. There's a lot of damage there on that left-hand rear, and we saw how hard that car went in the fence in the approach to Forest Elba. Off the road here for car 50, Jackson Evans. He may not get out of there in a hurry either. The no. exit is now closed. Red flag triggered. No. No. It's all right. It's in quite deep, isn't it? So this is the run in to turn one at Hell Corner, and we'll lock the whole way. Yeah, it's an awkward one, isn't it? And that's why, in some cases, the drivers release that brake and go down the escape road down at Hell Corner, because if you end up in that awkward position where you're neither turning nor going straight ahead, you just end up in that gravel down there. Uh, Kevin Estray did it last year, and uh, it, there's no getting out of there in a hurry. The so, most famous one, you talk about famous ones in that spot, the most famous one with the two JPS BMWs with Jim Richards and George Fury. Remember, 635 BMWs, and they were both parked in there. And Richard gets out, and he says, George, 
what are you, what are you going to do? You're going to stay in there? He said, well, at least get out and help me dig my car out. So Jim was Jim was digging one side. George Ferry was digging the other side to try to get one of the cars back out and into the race. He's a very funny guy, Richo, with that stuff. 1985. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, there was also an, a, a wild Craig Lowndes and Mark Winterbottom spin there in 2014, you may recall. There's been, well, actually, if you really want to go through it, I could probably walk through all 23 corners and we can get the highlights reel out and give you plenty of examples of things that have gone wildly wrong here, one way or another. Good news here for uh, both Dean and for Jackson. Jackson in the car at the moment is no damage to this car. It's just gone up into the runoff area. At turn one, on the approach to Mountain Straight, it's buried down there. They'll get that dragged out. Go back to the team and make sure that they've got all the dirt and debris out of the front of the car and uh, get it on its merry way once again. And uh, So all the extension of the red flag piece is over. Yeah, we've already used up our, our credit. There's yep. a little bit of... You get a little bit of leeway in credit when the red flag goes out, so that got expended in the Cam Creek incident a bit early. Molly? James Courtney, pretty hairy spot to go off there. What, what goes through your mind when you're going through the grass, uh, the sand there? You're hoping it's going to slow you down before the wall, right? Yeah, it's pretty tricky into there into turn one. It's, um, you know, as we're pushing harder and harder, and the track drops away on the way in, so it's pretty easy to snag a front, like what happened to Jackson there. So it's, uh, he'll be happy he kept it off the wall, and, and um, yeah, it's just a red flag. Pull everyone in, and, and uh, we'll see how we go now. But Jack will have another think about it and have another go. You guys, from your camp, really great start to the day. Uh, all systems go from your end. How's it feeling? Yeah, the car's running really well. He's, uh, we made some changes overnight. Um, I managed to get that little uh, run this morning in on the new tyre for next year, so that was, a little, that was good because we changed engine overnight. Managed to get some miles on it, make sure everything was right for the session. Cars rolled out nice and speedy this morning, which is really good. And uh, yeah, we just got to keep that ball rolling all day. So, you know, they don't hand out any points or, or money today, so we've got to make sure we're there through today, nice clean day, no mistakes, and uh, we're there on Sunday. But speaking of tyres, I mean, we've seen quite a few shunts already, um, and we're only into Friday. I mean, we always see action here at Bathurst, but how much do you think it's it's getting to grips with the hard tyre, or is it the track conditions, or is, is this a bit more than normal that we're seeing? Yeah, look, I think it's a lot of it is, uh, you know, we've come so many years here with the, with the old gen car, which had, you know, a lot more downforce, and you could drive the car so much harder and it was so much more forgiving as it started to slide the old car it uh you know you could gather it up because you had that little bit extra downforce to play with but with the new one once she goes she's gone so it's and it's, it's such a fine edge and um you know it makes it so much harder for the uh, the guys that co coies and stuff that jump in that don't drive them all the time and especially guys that are doing super two and um gen three because it's you know it's a bit of a you got to flick the switch between uh, between cars, so it's uh, it's look it's so easy to happen. The wind is uh, gusting a bit today as well, and the track's really quite dirty offline. So if you're just a little bit wide, and plus in that Gen 3 slide, it's uh, yeah you're obviously going to be parked up on the side. Sounds fun. Uh, you're all learning your keep this weekend. Thanks, James. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Third most experienced combination in the race, James Courtney and Jack Perkins. Got 36 races here between them, and James has been a runner-up back in. 2007 with David Bernard. He's also been on the podium here with Jack, and uh, they'll be a uh, they'll be a strong combination. And they're off to a pretty good start, as James was just explaining there a moment ago. The car was a little slow in a straight line at one point yesterday, but sitting third at the moment is a good start, and uh, that's that they've made a significant improvement yeah, in absolutely. lap speed day on day. Mark. Now, Neil Crompton and you, Mark, and I in particular, we love the strategy stuff, right? So I've just heard a little bit of intel that I know we'll all be interested in, and the fans, because this is going to play a role. We talked about this fuel flow earlier and this new little device, right? So let's just, again, I'll do the mosquito. Bzzz, let's go in, down into the fuel, down into the fuel cell. Now, we're starting to get some feedback from the pit lane on the fuel flow rate. Now, remember, we slowed it right up in the Gen 3 cars. It was too slow. They were stopping for too long. It was too easy for the drivers. We sped it up. We thought it was going to be about 3.5, 3.6 this weekend with this, this new device here. But we think as a consequence of everyone paying attention to this and paying attention to the angle of this hose here up here and how that all comes in cleanly, because everyone's worked out how critical this is. And we're down to little bits and pieces, right? I'm now here. In fact, I'm not even going to disclose the number, but I'll say at the moment, because we'll verify it later, it's work in progress. It's quite a bit more than 3.5, 3.6. Why is that really good? As I said, 15, 16, 17 seconds is going to be a great fuel stop. The driver is going to be under serious pressure if that fuel flow rate goes up. And that's a really cool thing.
I can't wait to yeah. find out the truth from you. <laughs> like, I'm gonna, it's when the session's done, I'll be straight down into the Hino you know, Hub to unpack that. Thank you for the update. We'll keep an eye on it. It's going to be all loaded into the strategy discussion, and that's going to unpack on Sunday, and it's going to be fascinating because we know just how important it's going to be. In fact, if I look all the way back to 2006, and the good news is that Jackson Evans is out of that sand trap down there at Turn 1. He's deposited a couple of yards of gravel as he's gone back out onto the racetrack. If you look from six through to last year, Mark, 11 of the last 18 years, the determinant between first and second in the race has been one second or less. No way. One second really? or less. Really? Yeah. Last year was a bit of an anomaly because Shane did a masterful job and was almost a 20-second margin. But if you look back through the ages, like in 2006, the gap was 0.6. In seven, it was 0.6. In eight, it was 2.5. In 2009, it was 0.7. 2010, it was 0.2 of a second. In and We're talking six and a half, seven hours of car racing. So the reason why Mark Larkham is putting an emphasis on this, folks, is because these millilitres of fuel, these microseconds, and how you deliver all that in the last stop or two are going to determine absolute outcomes Absolutely. here. Yep. Now... In this red flag, I've decided to invite myself up into the Supercars Executive Lounge, which is a beautiful spot to watch the action. I found Tim Watsford, who's the COO of Supercars, and Daniel Ciccone as well, because we're about to launch into next year Supercars Travel. And this is pretty exciting. If you've ever dreamt of a dream racetrack vacation, now is the time, Tim. Absolutely. Really proud to partner with Sportsnet and, uh, and formulate what is new, and it's a Sportsnet travel program. To your point, experiences, accommodation, flights, these guys have you sorted. Head to travel.supercars.com and ready to go for 25. Daniel, tell us a bit more about this. How does it work? We see this as a, a really new way to experience supercars, so we want to make it easy, more appealing, and just really, I guess, up the, the experience that people can get by travelling to events, not just these main ones like Bathurst, but right across the range, all 13 events next year, and the Bathurst 12-hour as well. Now, we're lucky, Tim, because we get to go to all these events. Thank you, Daniel. Is there one that the fans should absolutely put on their bucket list? I think we're, looking, we're, we're in it, aren't we, <laughs> yeah. Bathurst? Um, look, but, but to Dan's point, it's going to be right across the calendar, starting at the 12-hour here at the end of, end of January all the way through to kind of the Adelaide 500 at the end of next year. So we're excited. It's, a, it's something new for us. Um, keep your eyes on the website, and, and all the information will come out post-Gold Coast in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Daniel. There you go, Supercars Travel. This is how you can get to the best tracks in the country and New Zealand as well. We've got just inside uh, 10 minutes now in this practice three, the first one for Friday. We're counting down to Bismarck by qualifying later in the day. We do have another practice session in between. It's going to come up at five minutes past one local time or summertime here in New South Wales. So we've got a whole bunch of different time zones all around our country at the moment. Uh, so do you forecast any Hollywood numbers here in the back end of this session now, Mark, or is it just going to be a question of trying to get through to the end of the run plan? Well, I think given that the number of cars still with the co-driver in i think there are a lot of alternate plans going on crumper so half the field basically have got the co-driver in you can also see that some of the lead drivers we saw just before the red flag that they were starting to have a go again feeney's number is pretty impressive and when you look at that 0.09 of a second across the top four cars continues to demonstrate just how close this is going to be when we get to qualifying later on this afternoon it's going to be a ripper um, I reckon there might be a couple that put some tyres on. We've got heaps of hard tyres this weekend. There's no drama with quantity of tyre. And you probably want, for some of them, just to get a little guide as to what this is going to be like at a similar time to the race start in terms of the tyre grip and the way that this track might evolve. Temperature continues to just climb out there at this point in the day. It's starting to nudge up towards 19 degrees now from our little temp sensor that we've got in the broadcast area. So the track is uh, under blazing sunlight out there at the moment. There's some really high level cloud in a few places, but you can see uh, that it's bathed in light. A couple of shadows up there on the approach to turn four up to the cutting, which caught Scott Pye yesterday afternoon. Quick snapshot of the universe at the moment. We're into the sixes and we've got five cars that have got into those high sixes. Six, seven for Feeney, Thomas Randall with a six, eight. James Courtney with a six, eight, which is a really big turnaround for speed with that car, well done. Kind of a 26, the Richie Stanaway car currently in the hands of Dale Woods also got into the sixes, so he's firing at the moment, Richie. Uh, Lee Holdsworth driving with Chas Mostert also in the sixes, so the lovely part about all this story is just the crazy tight number between those guys that we've walked through. It's a tenth of a second covering those top five cars.
fastest sectors at the moment. Will Davison, who was lacking a little bit of time on the racetrack yesterday and some speed, fastest through sector one. Brock Feeney's gone quicker over the top of the hill and his teammate Will Brown's mastered the last sector. And we're just in that last sector here at the moment. I was really interested to see Brock Feeney then attacking the circuit. He's done the fastest sector two. And part of the technique and the way that you minimise the risk at Skyline is not to drive from McPhillamy Park all the way to the left-hand side to the wall. He basically runs mid-track over the top of the hill at Skyline and you reduce the amount of turning that you do at the top of the hill and therefore the amount of slide the car has coming down through the S's. So Feeney, of all the people so far, it's actually the narrowest line off the top of Skyline compared to all the others that are using it as more of a serious corner and a serious right-hander. Molly? Steve Fiore, we've just seen Jackson Evan come back in, swap the tyres. The clean-up's just finished. There's a bit of, bit of gravel. Uh, any feedback from Jackson? What went wrong there? We just made a change and we knew it might affect the front locking margin um, and it did. So just a small mistake um, that's going to happen here. So it's all good. Pull him out and away we go. And yesterday we saw you uh, make a quick bathroom dash. Um, we're keeping our distance because you're not feeling that, that well this weekend. Um, how are you feeling? What, uh, what's, what's the issue? Is it the flu? And um, do you reckon you'll be able to get through all right with a bit of electrolytes? I actually, I don't know what it is. Um, I just need to harden up, I think. But it's anywhere else, any other track in Australia, you can deal with a little bit and, and go out and do a half decent job. At this place, it's very, very hard as you're coming across the top and you go through the grate and you're coughing. It's, it's less than ideal. So, um, But every day I'm be getting better and the team's bitch is giving, giving me the best. Adrenaline does wonders. Exactly, exactly. Thanks, Dean. And we've got a red flag scenario here, as you can see, uh, as Dean was just in his explanation, there's something weird has gone on uh, at Turn 2, Griffin's Bend, uh, and in fact on Mountain Straight as well. So. Car number 10 at the moment, Dylan O'Keefe is in that car. We're on board with him now, and he's trying to get out of a really awkward position there at the apex of turn two, precariously positioned and exposed to all of right. our oncoming Talking traffic. Turn this to the right-hand side of the car. All right. So is he given the wall of life on the run-up right there before what he's happened? got there on the left side? Yeah, I, I, let's listen to the... I broke on the grass. Ah, oh, he's gone onto the grass on the left. <sighs> I broke on the, on the grass. Yeah, copy, copy. Right, so then I reckon he's given the wall right. wipe on the way the up on the left side. But I don't know what's going on also with the Cooper Murray car. But we can't see down that side of the car there at the moment. So when this car was first located there, it, the left rear it, definitely, yeah, it's, it definitely hit the left rear. So how's two Matt Stone cars in that session mm. with serious damage? And so, oh, so this is... OK, now this makes a lot more sense. So he's lost control in the braking area. Oh, geez, they've got some work ahead. Now, look at this, but this is the one that I saw. So when that car first come to rest, parked against the inside apex, watch the Chico car across the inside in the grass. That is a remarkable save. That's Brody. Yeah, Great well done. situational awareness from Brody Kostecki to deal with this. OK, so I figured he might have hit the wall earlier than that. It was much later, and it's rolled back down to the apex. And how's Brody's sense to recover from that and climb up on the grass on the traffic island on the inside. So watch this. One car, one Erebus car goes right. Now the next tyre power car is Jack LeBrock drives teams. around the back. This session has been declared. It will not <laughs> resume. So I think from what we could gather from the radio comms that Dylan basically got the grass with the passenger side of the car. So the left-hand side of the car in the braking area in Mountain Straight has lost control based on the car just being outside that white line on the tar, caught the grass, and then has lost control in the brake. Well then, Anaconda highlights of a dramatic practice three. Now, we set the clock here at one hour. We would actually go over that one hour mark here today with a number of red flag incidents in this session. And furthermore to that, there was also the ability to practice driver changes, brake pad changes, brake rotor changes, refueling. So there was a lot to work through across the course of this one-hour session, plus trying to tune these cars and give the co-drivers, especially those who don't have quite as much experience as some of the others, a little bit more of a chance to get their head around this car and the setup. So for car 87, that car was in the fence yesterday. We know that, but they did a great job of getting it back into one piece and back for this third practice session. And it started off relatively quiet.
The early part of the session was actually led by car 55 with Thomas Randall and Tyler Everingham, but that car spent a number of minutes in pit lane. Here they are right now on screen with a water pump issue at the front of that car. They spent 15 minutes with the folks at the Ford helping to change that out. Then the dramas began, and it started with Cameron Crick. I remember driving SB Tools car here this weekend. Whack! We've seen some guys go in there in the past. Heavy contact. And Cam Hill's car, which was really quick yesterday, top five speed in practice, was in the fence. Believe it or not, it would actually get worse for Matt Stone Racing. So that was red flag number one. We go back into it. That car back out on track after that water pump change. And it was flat out once more. Let's see who's got the speed and who's got the setup. For car 88, that car was actually, to use Brock Finney's words, scaring him a little bit with the setup in the rear. They tried to calm it down with a new set of shocks and springs. We had Jackson Evans in the wall down at turn one and in the gravel, and then a bit further up at turn two at the end of the session, Dylan O'Keefe and the Bennex car hard into the fence as well. So car 88 tops the session, but multiple cars of Matt Stone Racing have ended up in the fence. Drama, drama, drama. And that's the big story out of practice three, isn't it, Mark Skate? For Matt Stone Racing to have substantial damage to both of their cars puts that team under immense pressure as we count down to qualifying later this afternoon. There's a lot of mistakes happening up there on Mount Panorama. I, I didn't expect that, Jess. In fact, I thought session three, in terms of the way we're going about the planning of this weekend, was going to be pretty tame. I thought there was going to be a lot of pit stop you know, practice. I thought there'd be a lot of driver change. I thought there'd be a lot of practical stuff done rather than serious pace shown. We saw one tenth of a second separate the top five cars. So basically it was very, very close. But for that team there, for Matt Stone, significant damage on the Cam Creek Cam Hill car. And this is the replay of it. So I reckon there might've been a little brush with the fence up there coming off the back of the dipper, but for sure, he has clipped the inside wall on the way into the Forest Elbow and that's ricocheted into the left-hand side fence and that's a really hard hit. That's where Mostert had that really big crash yeah. uh, in 2015. So uh, then, so we, we got through all of that, but to your point, then to have a braking area issue for Dylan O'Keefe and for him to catch the grass in the braking area, like 250 kilometres an hour is when you're stopping the car up there, that was then a big spin and a pretty big incident mm. for the other car in that garage. So of all the days, it just never rains, it pours, doesn't it? <laughs> Certainly does, Mount Panorama delivering. Uh, tell me then what the plan is inside the team when you have substantial damage across the two cars. How do they actually go about putting a timetable together to make sure that they can potentially have them both out there for qualifying this afternoon? Yeah, How do so, you manage it? Well, yeah, look, the, the biggest thing about it is properly assessing the damage, Jess. So you've got to basically say, hey, this car has got rear and front damage. It looks like the other car's got more just rear damage. You then say, righto, guys, we know we're going to have to change a complete rear corner. So you start to assemble all the parts. And then Matt Stone, what Matt Stone will be thinking about there right now, if you haven't thought about what will be, how do I prioritise this and what do I do yeah. to apportion the manpower to get this done? And because both cars are damaged, it'll essentially be team for team. So they'll basically say, OK, the normal crew of people on that car, plus the tyre guys, they'll all be in it. The engineers will also be part of it. Even the, the crew that are data engineers, they'll also be contributing. In fact, we've seen Matt Stone himself under the car doing work. So Matt will be applying every bit of resource you can possibly apply to get both those cars going again. It will be all hands on deck, no doubt about it. Let's jump inside the garages now and have a word with the boss, Ree. Yeah, I just want to try get Matt. I'll just let him uh, have a look under the car for a second. I just have had an update on Cameron Crick, though. He is in the medical centre getting some attention. Uh, he's OK. They just need to check on him for a little bit longer, but uh, the word is that he is OK. So that is good news there. I'll just... Actually, let's go to Nick Perkett first. Uh, Nick. Hello. What a session for this team. Um, did you hear any feedback from Dylan O'Keefe before that happened? Uh, no, I didn't have my headset on, so I didn't hear much. I saw it, went, oh, that's not ideal, but yeah. Um, MSI guys do a mega job. Um, they'll rebuild the two cars. Um, I think, thankfully, my car hit the tyre wall, so hopefully it hasn't had a, you know, a, a big shock through the car. Um, and then, yeah, we'll rebuild um, car four, obviously, and Cricky and give him some love, because, uh, First time here, it happens. Um, I was only two years ago, I put a defence there during the race, so it's 
tricky spot. So yeah, we'll give the co-drivers a bit of a bit of a hug, a bit of love, um, and then yeah, the boys do a mega job and tidy them up. And the good thing is when you your boss is on the ground um, doing the repairs, it's it's uh, it's pretty cool to see that you know the management gets in there and gets it done. We might see if we can quickly grab Matt. I don't want to interrupt him. I know how busy they are. Sorry, Matt. Can I just have two seconds yeah, with you? No Sorry. Uh, what a time for you guys. Yeah. How, how do we manage this? Uh, look, you know, we'll just get in there and try and tune them up. But, you know, the, the co-drivers have got one job and that's not, um, not messed it up for the main driver. And unfortunately, both our guys didn't do that today. So, look, it's, um, it's not a great situation, but we'll tune it up and hopefully make it out for the, for the next practice and definitely get it out for quality. A quick assessment on this car. How bad is it? Chassis is not too bad. Suspension is destroyed, so bolt all new suspension in it, and um, hopefully we've got an hour and 40 minutes, so it's going to be tight for the next practice session, but we'll give it a go. I'll let you get to it. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Craig Lowndes, another dramatic session. Did we see Cooper also slowing at the end of that session? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think that uh, with so many red flags, we tried to go through our program as quick as we could. Um, we actually took some, we pumped some fuel out of it, so I don't know how much we took out, but uh, he's uh, got no fuel pressure at the moment. So uh, our fixes are quite easy one compared to others, uh, or compared to others, but um, yeah, the poor little bugger, he's in the car and we're trying to tell him to prime it and do everything else to try and build fuel pressure, but uh, he's trying to find all those little switch buttons, but uh, uh, look, we'll, we'll We'll investigate, but as I said, our, our fix is a quite easy one. So it's either run out of fuel or, or a fuel pump, e either sortable, but uh, at least you want to run out of fuel today, not not tomorrow or, or come big, the big day on Sunday. But looking, um, we were just chatting before, and I was chatting to James Courtney as well. He's been around the game a long time too, in terms of just all the drama that we're seeing in, in these sessions and, and kind of trying to unpack why. And, you know, as you were saying, with these new cars, you've got such a fine margin. Do you think that's what it is? Or has the pressure ramped up somehow? I mean, the pressure in Bathurst is, is always high. Well, I think all the above. I think the pressure obviously is building because we're getting closer now to qualifying later on this afternoon. But the cars are lighter. No, they flighty across the top. You know, we're talking about getting a little bit of wheel spin over the hump at Mount and straight across the top of the mountain. You've got to be more precise. Um, you know, we saw Scotty Pye get caught out going up into the cutting. So the cars do move around more, which I, I love because it sort of goes back to the late 90s. Um, but it, it's one of those things that drivers uh, really just got to be more precise. You know, the cars over Skyline get a little bit flighty. Then you've got to get them settled down to get into the dipper, down into Forest Elbow. So it's all those little tricks you just got to look out for. But yeah, the pressure is building and there's no doubt about that. This is the biggest race we all come for, for the, you know, for, especially for us that we only get an opportunity once. And your car, everything's good with the setup. You seem to be making some good ground on that side. Yeah, session one yesterday wasn't so good. We tried something a little bit different um, and we've now migrated a little bit to 88 and the, and the car feels much nicer. You know, this morning we're, we're running around on old tyres and sort of heavy fuel and the car flows much nicer across the top, which obviously for driver, it's much more confident, inspiring. Poor old Cooper was just about to go out and just do a bit of a simulation of qualifying. So, you look, it's just, uh, you know, he's he's warming to it. I've told him just to build up. You know, we just don't want to be changing what others are doing right now. As I said, our fix is quite easy one. Thanks, Craig. Cheers.